You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcast on Netroots Radio or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for December 4th, 2020. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the global headquarters of the Cornfield Resistance, where we know what we saw. We know what we saw. And we signed a piece of paper saying if we're wrong, we can go to prison. Did you? Huh? Did you? Did you? It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. Ties in the world. Oh no! Long Island iced teas in the world for me to sound that crazy. No, no. That's now we're getting into Peggy Noonan territory there. <laughs> you, know, you know, on the breathalyzer, did you blow a Noonan? Because it sounded like she did. <laughs> she sure did. We're talking about a lady who gave testimony yes. before Republicans. She's an expert. I'm an expert. And she saw some shit. I saw she, some crazy stuff. I saw stuff on the stage. I was on the stage. You weren't on the stage. Nobody else was on the stage. Just I was on the stage. Yeah, yes. It was pretty. Rudy uh, Rudy had to tell her to dial back her role. Yes. But um <laughs> Mark this Mark this day. This is when Rudy Giuliani told one of his witnesses to dial it back just a little bit. Yeah. It's, you know, and I, I she was clearly drunk. Yeah. Yeah. Um I mean, like she had to start drinking much earlier. To work herself up to being this drunk, and then she had to go past a bunch of people who were like, I assume, prepping her or mm-hmm. getting her seated or putting her microphone near her mouth or talking to her in some way. So there was a whole process by which she got from whatever bar she was at to the microphone <laughs> where a whole bunch of people said, yeah, whatever. I'm sure she'll be fine. I'm sure she'll do just fine. Well, I mean, Rudy Giuliani is fine every time he goes out sure. on Fox or whatever and sure. has clearly been drinking. So, And this is the you know the end of the Third Reich, misfits. There's nobody left but the weirdos and the perverts mm-hmm. and the drunks mm-hmm. and the drug addicts mm-hmm. and the ones who just want to loot the Louvre and get away with all the art in Paris. And there's, right. there's nobody left. There's no ideological core to anything. Nobody believes anything. It's just a bunch of – it's just a shit show full of crazy people. Who are all held aloft by the fact that 74, 75 million Americans think that Donald Trump is the second coming. It's the and only apparently reason. a whole lot of them are willing to part with money. Yeah. To support the fantasy that Donald Trump can be president for four more years. Yeah, which is great for him. I mean, these are the, the overlap. Understand, these are people who will go without masks. Who mm-hmm. are willing to die for the dear leader and who will scrape together their last 20 bucks during the middle of a pandemic and send them to him because they are just that fucked in the head. And th- that's the whole th- that's the whole Republican Party. That's it. Right. There's nobody else left inside the four walls of the Republican Party but these meatheads and the people who feed off of them. And that's it. There's no there's nobody to negotiate with anymore. There's no party over there anymore. There's just an enemy camp full of crazy people. Um, that we have to somehow contain and deal with, as you would contain and deal with any other outbreak of lunacy in your community. Mm -hmm. So today is part four of our political university. Yes. And today is for our friend Steve. Hello, Steve. Steve is somebody that meets with us face-to-face every once in a while, comes down to Springfield. He lives in Illinois part of the year. He consults with us. He tells us what we should do and not <laughs> what do. What we and, should do. Yeah. Actually, he brings us. He's a great guy. He brings us the best tomatoes. And, uh, yes, he coffee. does. He brings tomatoes from his garden and mm-hmm. we have coffee with him. And uh, he definitely wants us to talk about how the media is not our friend. Yes. His catchphrase, believe it or not, he has a catchphrase on Twitter, is MSNBC is not your friend. MSNBC is not your friend. Yeah. So we are going to talk about that. We feel like we've been talking about that for 10 years. We have. But uh, <laughs> Going on 11, by the way. Yeah. And And – and let's face it, yeah, it'll be 11 years in January. It My will goodness. Be. Will be. Uh, amazingly, this week, there have been some, you know, real knife jab examples of this happening that this automatically adopting Republican framing yes. for the position from which you will ask a question mm-hmm. on cable news. It, it's been this week, it's as fresh as, you know, this week's headlines. Uh, I wanted to give Carolee at Crooks and Liars uh, a hat tip for this one because she caught Dana Bash at CNN interviewing 
Senator Doug Jones of Alabama, who lost his race. And Mm -hmm. this is another situation. We talked about this last week where in the 2018 midterms, Democrats who should not have won, won. And Doug Jones won for several reasons, not the least of which was his opponent was clearly a uh, sexual deviant. (laughs) And uh, Doug Jones, a great man, you know, he's the one that prosecuted the racists who killed the four little girls in the 16th Street Baptist Church. Yeah, the bombing. Yes. It took decade. It took over a decade, but he's the one. He is the DA who went after those uh murderers, terrorists, yeah. And terrorists mm-hmm. and uh got a conviction. Mm-hmm. Um and and so but he was being interviewed because he is now a lame duck senator because during a general election when an incumbent Republican president is on the ballot, Alabama is going to vote Republican. Mm-hmm. And that is that is not Doug Jones's fault. <laughs> that is not Alexandria Ocasio Cortez's mm, fault. Nope. Nope. <laughs> that is the way Alabama votes. Yeah. And I lived in Alabama for 14 years. Yes, I can you tell did. you that is how Alabama votes. You know, it, here's imagine the opposite. You know, I, mm-hmm. I come I came down from uh, a very liberal district in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And by the same token, it wouldn't matter uh, what the candidate said. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't matter uh, that their opponent was a Republican in, in the middle or if the Republican wanted to you know, privatize everything and sell off children. It wouldn't mm-hmm. matter because that district always votes D plus 14 or D plus 20. Right. Just, that's the way it is. Well, and, and the other perfect example of that is Scott Brown in Massachusetts, yeah. who in a special election in the dead of winter with a terrible opponent who did not who took for granted that people were going to vote for her. Yeah, bad, bad, bad opponent. Bad yeah. idea. Went on vacation during the campaign and mm-hmm. was and treated voters like shit. Shake their hands. What if they're dirty? Right. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. Scott Brown won. He did, and was elected to the U.S. Senate from Massachusetts on Ted Kennedy's seat. Right, and on the promise that he would put a stop to this uh, Affordable Care Act thing. Affordable Care Act. Right. Yeah. yeah. So his voters turned out in a very weird set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. And then when you have a regular general election in Massachusetts with Democratic voters aware that there's an election going on Mm -hmm. in November instead of January, which is a huge difference in terms of Massachusetts weather, Mm -hmm. you get Elizabeth Warren Warren, elected to the Senate. Oh, okay. Everything's normal normal again. That's great. That's nice. Okay. So this is not about anything to do with the larger Democratic Party that Doug Jones did not get reelected to the Senate. This is just special election versus general election. And so Dana Bash asked Doug Jones about, are Democrats moving too far left? Is that why you lost? Are you you mad at at AOC for ruining your chances with all her crazy talk of socialism? Now, now to her credit, Dana Bash, to my knowledge, was not overtly drunk when she said this. So (laughs) give her that. Got to give her that. No. But uh, this kind of framing is obscene. Yeah. Yes, it is. And then you have an example of Jake Tapper. Oh, yes. Jake Tapper today. Interviewing Kamala Harris. Kamala has, asking her whether uh, Biden's cabinet is progressive enough. Because oh. that's the real important thing. You know, it, it really, it, it has nothing to do with policy or procedure or the, the uh, legislation they're trying to put through. It's, you know, who are you pissing off? Are you, mm-hmm. are you threading the needle? Have you been diverse enough? Have you... And her answer was not, go fuck yourself, Jake, which is my answer, which is why I'm not under consideration for any higher office. But her answer was, you know, we're not done yet. We're not even halfway done yet. Why don't you ask me when we're completely done, the cabinet's in place, and then we'll have this conversation. Which it, seems is good- like, it seems like Joe Biden is going for qualified over some sort of, and, and frankly, in the economic in the economic area, he is going full progressive. He is going full populist. He is going with people who have been on food stamps or are aware of, of the needs of poor people. He is really going. I mean, when I heard Paul Krugman say, <laughs> yeah, he put three people on the Council of Economic Advisors and all three of them are qualified to be chairman of that. Yeah. And all of them are good progressives and I have no complaints with any of them. I was like, okay, then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
Uh, the complaining will come later, I assure you. Yeah, and sure it will. <laughs> of course it will. Yeah. There but, will be things we will not like. But yes. there are just, there is, every time you step in front of a camera, unless you're a never Trumper, um, you will be, if you're a, if you're a Democrat, if you're, if you're attached to uh, the, the, the incoming White House in any way, you're going to be asked questions about whether too far left, not left enough, center, are you center right? Do you find centrism? What do you think of the uh, Problem Solver Caucus? And those are process gotcha questions that at this point, any person who goes on television should be smart enough to say, fuck you, I'm not answering that question. If you'd like to ask me about what I think the American people need in terms of legislation to get them through what is going to become a, a simultaneous economic and health catastrophe over the next three months, worse than anything that's come before. I will tell you dollars and cents, who needs what, where, and when, and I'll tell you exactly who is standing in the way. Mm-hmm. And I'd be mm-hmm. happy to have that conversation all day long. But if you want to sit here and jerk me around about what too far left, too far right, what's going on? I don't want to talk to you about that. That's, That's silly a stupid, season question. Nobody, yes. nobody right. who's about to kick, kick, about kicked out of their apartment cares about that shit. Right, right. You care about right. it because you're not about to lose your job. Because you've got twenty million in the bank. Because you've got and seven job houses, security. right? Yeah. Right. But right. everyone else, no one else gives a shit about that. You're just trying to cause trouble. If you want to ask me hard questions about climate change, that's great. If you want to ask me tough questions about marginal tax rates, that's terrific. But we're not going to talk about, you know, where the needle is exactly and how is, is it diverse enough? Is it too diverse? What's going on here? Where's where's your representation? Of people of Martian descent. I mean, really. You know, have, have we talked about <laughs> you that have, enough? Do you have enough white guys in your cabinet? Is, right. is, is Joe Biden white enough? <laughs> and yeah, that's, where and, it's silly season. It really is. And when on the other side, the only thing you have to talk about is Donald Trump 46 minutes on Facebook Live. Well, yeah, because he can't get on Fox anymore, apparently. That's no. a real shame. No, he no. can't. He cannot destroy democracy on networks that feel that they might have some accountability for the violence that will ensue. Well, and his problem with Fox now is that he might cut into Glenn Greenwald's time. And that, <laughs> you know, well, that's a real delicate balancing act there. You gotta, who, who knows who goes where? Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, let's talk just for a moment. Not surprisingly, MSNBC's ratings are up. Uh, that happens after a candidate wins their channel. You know, and it right. is, MSNBC is perceived as a Democratic channel. Fox is perceived as a Republican channel. Uh, I think it goes further than that in terms of propaganda at Fox, the Fox end. Uh-huh. Uh, but their ratings are up. And that is to be expected. That does happen. During mm-hmm. the Obama years, right after Obama was reelected, MSNBC ratings were up. Okay. Um, but Fox News is hemorrhaging viewers to Newsmax and OAN. Yeah. Th- that The good news is. They're hemorrhaging viewers. The right. bad news is they're not hemorrhaging them to the Wall Street Journal right. or MSNBC <laughs> or their local news or to country music stations. No. They're losing right. them to people who are willing to give them redder meat than they get on mm-hmm. Fox News. Mm-hmm. And and really, they're they're giving them to people who will lie and tear down democracy to make them feel good. It's that heroin. Yeah. It's that horrible drug that is destructive. To the body politic, and uh, it's a it's scary. Well, and scary it's, to me. And and this is this is again why it's so important. I think to as as however desperate and and rear guard action this might be to guard your access to history as it actually unfolded over the last half century, mm-hmm. so we can mm-hmm. learn from it, so we can understand how we got where we are. Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. not pretend that everything started in 2016. Yep. Because yep. I know that I've been writing about the Republican Party as a as an addiction, um, a literal addiction, going back to the Bush administration. Right. And, right. and you know, the, Ronald Reagan was their first line of pure, unstepped on cocaine right up their nose. They've been chasing that high ever since. Mm-hmm. And they hated mm-hmm. Bill Clinton because he was methadone. He yeah. was maintenance. Yeah. He was just... You know, a stingy little dose of, of you know, triangulated center-right centrism bullshit. And George Bush, man, that was fucking ketamine. You know, that was – and they were willing to crawl through dumpsters for that high. And Trump yeah. is the next level. Trump yeah. is the next yeah. thing in line. Trump is the next horrible drug. And there's a quote by William Burroughs that I put up on Twitter that um, Jay Rosen liked. 
which is about the heroin merchant, the junk merchant, doesn't improve his product. Mm -hmm. He doesn't mm -hmm. sell the product to you. He sells you to the product. Mm -hmm. And then he can mm -hmm. cheapen and cheapen and cheapen the product and you'll still buy it because you need it. And that's exactly what's happened to the Republican base. They, yeah. have, yeah. they have dumbed themselves down, lobotomized themselves, chasing an ever more obviously toxic and deranged drug because they can't function without it. So if Fox News isn't going to tell them that we should have a military coup in this country, when clearly we should, they're going to go find someone who'll tell them what they want to hear. They'll go to the next whorehouse and the one after that. They'll find someone who will dress up like a news person and tell them the lies they want to believe. And they will spend their money there. And there you will find, you know, Donald Trump on YouTube and mm -hmm. a bunch of people who couldn't get a job anywhere else on the face of the earth uh, making a lot of money, mm -hmm. telling the rubes what they want to hear. So uh, you want to talk about Michael Steele being on MSNBC as sort of a an example of – I do. I MSNBC do. is not your friend. <laughs> yeah. Well – I, I think sometimes MSNBC no. is your friend. I mean, I'm, I am grateful for Rachel Maddow and I'm grateful for – who, by the way, she is just pantsing mm -hmm. Sean Hannity right now oh, yeah. in the ratings. Yeah. And, of course, what is Fox's excuse for any time somebody calls them on their bullshit? Well, our ratings. Our ratings. Our ratings are great. Yeah, that was And that is why we justify whatever we're doing. We have the ratings to prove that we are saying what people want to hear and, what pe and the giving the product that people want. Yeah, just before they toss Bill O'Reilly over the side. Yeah. Um, the, the answer was, well, have you seen his numbers? Have you seen his numbers? Yeah. Those, yeah. Look at those yeah. numbers. And that's that it, it is. And these are people who are by and large broadcasting from home because mm -hmm. it's not safe to be in a studio, but who are perfectly willing to lie to people about the safety and uh, about public health issues. They, they, yeah. These are not, these are evil people. If you work at Fox, you're an evil person. Mm -hmm. I don't care what job you have there. If you took a job with Team Evil, you're a bad person. And the people at Fox are perfectly willing to destroy, to to cripple their listeners, to destroy oh, viewers, to to kill them, to deprive them of money, to sell them a parcel of lies, to for ratings and money and power. And it is it's not any more complicated than that. And and the the dirty secret is that there are 73, 74 million Americans who are just that fucked in the head, just that stupid, just that nakedly fascistic. And they have been getting worse and worse. It's like um what did I call it in the last couple of days? Like wingnut Moore's law. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. where where Republican voters get twice as stupid and twice as desperate every 18 months. <laughs> you know, it, yeah. it just keeps yeah. it, they just keep getting and there's no Real, you know what the end of this is. The end of this is World War II. The end of mm -hmm. this is the rise of fascism in Europe. That's where that party is going. And there is no one standing in their way, and there's no one they'll listen to anymore outside of their own little circle of friends. So the minute you tell them something they don't want to hear, they go to Newsmax. Right. And so I was talking about um, uh, what happens. Why? Why oh why? And we, we've seen this with Chris Hayes, too, it, which was – You've got a Saturday morning, Sunday morning show. It's pretty sort of relaxed and open ended, and you get interesting guests, and you talk a lot. You talk a lot like a liberal blogger. And then they move you to prime time, and you wear a suit, and you tighten that up a whole lot. And that's what's happening to Joy Reid. Mm -hmm. um, I, I well, and part of that is the format of primetime news, and I understand she has she has a different requirement and a different audience, frankly, sure. that's in prime time five nights a week than she does on a Saturday show. And and that that part is fine. Mm -hmm. The part I'm not fine with is rehabilitating Michael Steele's reputation. Yeah. Yeah. Um I don't know what whether that's a deal they did or whether they have some sort of um system where you're obliged if it, the deal is if you want this position, you are obliged to have X number of never Trumpers on your show. Because I can't go, you know, if you just skip randomly over to MSNBC, you're going to find Bill Crystal there. You're going to find Charlie Sykes there. You're going to find Michael Steele there. All lying about the time prior to 2016. Mm -hmm. And Michael mm -hmm. Steele is on her show laughing and joking and smiling real big and just lying about the past. And that is really not okay with me. I, I got into a conversation with someone on Twitter, which does happen to me from time to time when I'm not in Twitter jail. And... It, he, they made a very good point, which was this is the Nichelle Nichols quandary on Star Trek. Is it 
Do you stay there for the representational reason? Because that in and of itself has merit. And just suck it up with Bill Shatner stealing your lines and trying to get you fired. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. And my, I thought about that a lot. I said, well, there's there's some validity in there. Having Joy Reid on uh, one of the three major cable networks during prime time is, is and a- And she is the first African-American yeah. woman for sure to be doing that. Right. But here's the problem. The Oh, I looked over at uh, my TV right now and uh, Nicole Wallace is interviewing Tim Miller from The Bulwark. So- <laughs> What it's like? Okay, let's just timing. let's just shut this podcast down right now because <laughs> I don't need to say any more than that. I do have a little bit to say about Tim Miller later. And this is just literally over my shoulder. Like holy shit, it's like it jumped you know out of my brain onto my television. Um, but here's the problem with the Joy Reid uh, Nichelle Nichols example. Nichelle Nichols was an actress on a science fiction genre show that is selling a story, a fictional morality play, story, serialized um, fantasy. Two people on television every week. We, here's a ship going past. We're going to talk about our five-year mission. We know what this is. It's, a, it's, it's like gun smoke. <laughs> it's like the odd mm -hmm. couple. It's not real. Joy Reid is driving a news show. Putatively, that's what it is. Yeah. And oh, yeah. what she offers to her viewers is not a story about Klingons, or about Romulans, she offers to her her viewers her credibility. Mm -hmm. Implicit in every negotiate every every time you're on uh, see someone on television in a news capacity, what they are telling you implicitly is you can trust me that this person here next to me is telling you something you should probably know, mm -hmm. or they wouldn't mm -hmm. be there. There are 330 mm -hmm. million Americans mm -hmm. uh, in this country. 18 of them are on MSNBC, mm -hmm. so that tells you something. This is why Chuck Todd is such a toxic force in this country, because he keeps putting people on television who are clearly lying and not calling them on it. Um, but Joy Reid has had Michael Steele on more often than I, am, I, I can count. And Michael Steele is on her show to do one thing, to rehabilitate his reputation, to lie about the Republican Party in the past, to lie about his role on it, to lie about what drove him out of the Republican Party, to lie about the Republican Party of the future, and to lie about his role in that. Mm -hmm. And he can, and mm -hmm. in the middle there, he can laugh and joke about what crazy people, do, what these crazy Republicans and what they're doing. But he's still a Republican, and he is not going to give one inch up of his bullshit story about how he personally got rid of the, the bigots in the GOP while he was there. And once he was gone, they all rushed back in because that's his lie. That's the lie he tells every time he opens his mouth. And what he doesn't need is someone putting their arm around him, giving him credibility in that lie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what you get if you're a never Trumper on MSNBC. You get liberal credibility. You know, even Joy Reid knows that Michael Steele's a good guy. Even Chris Hayes know, know, vouches for Charlie Sykes. Even so and so thinks Rick Wilson's a good guy. And that is going to come back to haunt us because those people should be allowed to re-enter society like any ex-offender <laughs> would be able to, having paid for their crimes and confessed to their crimes and being sorry for what they did, taking some fucking responsibility for what they did. And Michael Steele just will not do that. He hired himself out as an African-American man to front for a party of racists. That's how he made his money. That is a despicable thing to do. He doesn't do anything else. That is his one thing. And that one thing should shame him and drive him from public view. Instead, he gets him a fucking guest spot and a contract on liberal television. And that mm -hmm. is a bad mm -hmm. thing because that is what got us fucking Donald Trump. It was the willingness to, to forget the Bush administration ever happened and the willingness to put up with the, the, the insane amount of racism and, and nonsense that came pouring out of the GOP the minute Barack Obama was elected president. And the, the willingness to both sides everything all the time, no matter how nakedly obvious it was that it wasn't both sides, that's what landed us with a Republican Party willing to nominate Donald Trump. I just want to note that as far as I can tell, uh -huh. searching for this, Michael Steele's never been on Rachel Maddow. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it either. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think there's a pecking order. Oh, uh, there clearly is. 
And I think there are uh, lines that Rachel Maddow, as the top, you know, viewer getter oh, yeah. at the network, gets to say, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't think Bill That's Crystal. That's not my job. Bill Crystal, I don't believe, has ever been on the Rachel Maddow show. Yeah. I, I, and I, I, I did note, I did note as I was searching for this, that uh, on January 14th, 2011, and this is remembering stuff from before 2016, right? <laughs> that was Michael Steele's last day as RNC chair. Uh-huh. January 14th, 2011, mm-hmm. right after the midterms. And uh, Rachel Maddow opened her A block with that. Mm-hmm. And talked about the worst segment she had ever done on her show was where she made the race for GOP chairman into a horse race. And she had little horses uh-huh. and that she had a, an intern running these little horses on her show. And it was absurd and uh, really embarrassing for her. But she showed a clip of it, the geo preakness. Oh, and and how bad it was. And she said, I'm so embarrassed to show you this, but it, I want you to know I have taken, I've learned my lesson. We will not do that again. And so she talks about Reince Priebus being the new RNC chair. And then this is the transcript from January 14th, 2011. She says, the gentleman Reince Priebus takes over for, Michael Steele, is so unpredictable, so random, so gaff prone that it is no secret that Mr. Steele has been really fun to cover as Republican Party chairman these past two years. The random trips to Saipan at the start of the election season, the lesbian bondage theme strip club expense. Those are all fun. The, the you wear your hat to the left, we wear our hat to the right. It's a hat of an idea. Metaphors. Without Michael Steele, the Rachel Maddow show would have never owned the web address empathize right on your behind.com. Mm-hmm. I truly hope that Mr. Steele becomes a cable news host or something else that keeps him in the public eye. Uh-huh. So uh, she gets away with stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you have long talked about how. Uh, when someone joins the team of MSNBC, Rachel Maddow changes her tune. They're off and limits. Is a they're team player and yep. they're off limits. Yep. I don't I certainly don't think she would ever say anything like this about him no. on her show now that he is an MSNBC contributor. Can't. She uh, can't. I'm sure contractually she, yeah, she it's can't. In her contractually she can't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The only person who outdid her was um John Stewart. Because yeah. Michael Steele used to go on John Stewart's show all the time and you know, put his feet up and then relax conversation back when before he was the front man for the party of bigots and imbeciles. Mm-hmm. And then he got out in front of the party and then he got elected. Then they hired him because Barack Obama, oh my God, they've got a black guy. We got to get a black guy in a hurry. What about that guy? Mm-hmm. He's black and he, he talks pretty good. Let's put him in front. And that's what they did. And from that moment on, Michael Steele cranked out one of the dumbest craziest most obviously bullshit lines of well you know government jobs aren't real jobs right you know right. All, all this and I'm, I'm like really so a judge isn't a real job uh the lifeguard at at the public pool isn't those aren't none of those <laughs> are real jobs <laughs> and just just crazy bullshit i have to say shit about barack obama because that's now my job and i can't think of anything good to say so i'll just make shit up at which point john stewart stopped being friendly and started being a little more icy. And that's when Michael Steele, being a coward, uh, just stopped going on. And that's when... And he had to get a puppet to replace him. He got him. a puppet to replace him because, <laughs> let's face it, that's what Michael Steele is. He's a fucking puppet. And he's happy to be one. It pays his bills. Yeah, exactly. And that's, it pays his bills. Yep. And the one place I don't need to see anyone like that is on my liberal TV. Yeah. There's yeah. lots of other places for them in this world, but one of them is not sucking the credibility. Whatever credibility this, you know, the MSNBC is not your friend. Whatever credibility they have, they keep giving it to people who absolutely don't deserve it in an environment where no one will call them on it. That's the trick. Mm-hmm. You got to have it mm-hmm. in a place where everyone around the table agrees. If you call, if you start calling this guy out, you're going to lose a finger. So everyone just shuts up. And, and it's the silence of our allies that bothers me so much. Yeah. It's how much yeah. they're willing to say, I'm a journalist. I'm a crusading person on the side of truth, except for these people over here who are getting paid out of the same slot bucket as me 
We're going to let and all the pay of them is fly. really good. The pay is really good. I mean, yeah. we're all making yeah. crazy money, basically sitting here and and spitting out our opinions and reading copy from AP. So uh, we don't want to jeopardize that. We got a pretty good thing going here, um, and that's where I'm like, you know what? I I, I accept MSNBC for what it is. It's as good as we have, mm-hmm. and it's you mm-hmm. know it is less considerably less than half a loaf, but it's right. it's it, it. My imagination is the problem. I can imagine yeah. a much better, healthier public conversation about politics and policy than we're having anywhere on any of these well, shows. Well, I would like to see far less than 24-7 coverage mm-hmm. because I'm tired of the 24-7, you know, multiple news channels on cable that we just don't need. Well, and They all have breaking news every 20 minutes, honey. How, <laughs> how are we going to get by without that? I know. Yeah. And I'm wishing for too much. I understand that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we did we did get by as a nation with Walter Cronkite for we 30 did. minutes. And, we and, did. And, you know, the, was a Star Spangled Banner at 10 o'clock at night or 11 o'clock at <laughs> Turned night? Turned off. The, the TV the went off. off. And the, yeah. the Native American head and the test pattern. And I think somehow people we sle- survived. <laughs> people slept better, I think. Yeah. yeah. Now, we, there, I'm, there was a lot of stuff we didn't know about that we should have known about. I admit that. Uh, absolutely. But absolutely. The idea and that- it, was e- it was easy for a white, an evil White House in 1972 to uh, manipulate access to the White House uh, in a very, very bad way. Can I just say one thing about Tim Miller? Because I, I wrote up a thing. Yeah. I'm not sure if I'm going to post it, but I wrote up a thing. Uh, Tim Miller is is a is a um, contributor to the Bulwark, uh, mm-hmm. who disgraced himself when he worked for um, the Pod Save America people, <laughs> community people. They looked into his background and said, "Holy shit, this guy did a lot of nefarious stuff." Let's, he's gone. So of course he's immediately hired by Rolling Stone and the Bulwark and so forth. He's a Republican who regrets it, and that's great. Um, and now he's full time at the Bulwark, and he and Charlie Sykes, he's a regular on their thing. Um, but there was this interchange between them. This is the one that I'm like, oh, good. Liberals have officially ceased to exist <laughs> because there's this interchange between them where they're bitching about these these sort of nouveau anti-Trumpers who are only coming to understand that Donald Trump is a bad guy now. And they're jerking each other off about how, you know, we've been screaming about this for the last five years. Where have you been, huh? Where have you been? And I'm just no, that's their lifeboat. Their yeah. lifeboat says history began in 2016, and, you know. And yeah. um, this is a direct quote from Tim Miller when they're, they're talking about Gabe Sterling, the guy who finally said, the Republican who finally said, enough, 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 enough. Let's remind people who Gabe Sterling is. But Gabe Sterling is the Georgia official who went ballistic this week right. saying enough is enough. Stop the violent rhetoric. Stop suggesting that so and so just for doing her job needs to be shot. They put some a noose outside of someone's window. Yeah, uh, Republicans have gone violent yeah. uh, against against Georgia in particular. Against Republicans George, in Georgia. In Georgia, because mm-hmm. Georgia is their state, mm-hmm. and something's been taken away from them if Georgia is blue. And Gabe and Sherman. This is an argument, by the way, to get rid of the electoral college. Yes, it, it sure get is. Get rid of red and blue states because when you have it and it's just the popular vote, then you don't have this identity problem of this is our state, this is our territory. States votes, states vote, people don't vote, and therefore Georgia has to be red, or we're going to kill people. Well, and and so Gabe Sherman is a he's he's a Trump guy twice over. He's going to vote for Kelly Loeffler. He's going to vote for David Perdue. He's a he's a Republicans, Republican, and he's been very uh-huh. clear about that. But the fires finally came home. Mm-hmm. It finally started affecting him and his people personally. Then it was a bridge too far. Then it became a bad thing. And he stood on the stairs and he got very mad and he said, You got it. This is enough. Stop. You have to stop doing this right now. And that's great that he did that. Uh, and Tim Miller pops up with, You know, um, have any of the Trumpers since the election come out and said, you know what? The guys, these guys, these never Trumpers really had it right all along. <laughs> like this is just too far. And they're and they're talking about how those of us who've been yelling about this for the last five years really sort of deserve a medal of some kind. Really, <laughs> we deserve a lot of recognition. These guys, it's great they're finally coming along. They've finally figured this shit out. But you know what? And this is a direct quote from Charlie Sykes. Um, doesn't mean you, you, you throw them a parade. <laughs> Don't make them grand marshal, but at least give them a tasteful float in the parade. You know what? I'm happy to give Tim fucking Miller a tasteful float in my parade 
But when I hear someone <laughs> saying, you know what, how about, how about a little recognition of, of those of us who got this right five minutes ago, huh? Because the guys who only got it right three minutes ago, those guys are the assholes. And I'm, I'm sitting here going, <laughs> what happened to all the people who got this right 30 fucking years ago? Oh, th- oh that's right. We don't exist at all. Right. We're right. not in this conversation at all. There's no recognition. Every conversation you have from these heroes of the Republic is, you know, five years ago, we were out yeah. there kicking ass. We're the right. ones who got it right. And if you call them on it, if you simply tell them in a public forum, look, okay, great. You got that right. But what about the people that you shit on for 25 years? Mm-hmm. What about the and people? You, you made your bones on being the, the Rush Limbaugh of the Midwest. And just right. like that, you're blocked. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just yeah. like that, you're canceled. No, no, no. We're not having that conversation because that conversation is one I will lose. I will look like the assholes that I'm sniping at now who got the, who caught up a little bit later than I did. I want to be the righteous one. I want to be the one who got who, the light bulb went on and nobody knew how to separate water into hydrogen and oxygen before me. I figured that shit out and I should get all the credit. I'm like, you know what? There's enough credit to go around, but you have to sh- at some point acknowledge that you were a part of the problem and B there were people telling you for decades that this was coming and you chose to make money off of calling those people crazy. What about those people? And again, those people don't exist at all. And that's what really bothers me. Cause once you've erased the entire history of the country prior to 2016, you're begging for trouble. You're begging for trouble. Cause then you're setting yourself up as the person who gets to decide who gets listened to and who doesn't. And since your goal is to rebuild your shitty party with the same people, but no Donald Trump, it's going to be Rubio. <laughs> it's going to be Rubio. And we're all right. going to, and, and right. we're going to forgive them. And there's going to be a whole forgiveness thing and a whole bunch of, let's all get over this. Let's all move on. And, and those of us who are like, no, that's how this happened last time. This is exactly how we got Donald Trump are going to once again, end up like me standing on my front lawn, Screaming at you know the paper boy, <laughs> you know unfairly I might add, or looking over my shoulder, go, hey look, there's a couple, there's a uh, there's a Bush regime dead ender interviewing a never Trumper on my liberal TV, and that is the face of the future forever. So that's mm-hmm. what that's what bothers me. My, it bothers me that anytime you decide to amputate entire slabs of inconvenient history, you are begging, you are begging for the problem to come back twice as bad. Because remember. It's like a battering ram. The Bush administration was really bad. And then these same people all agreed to get together and pretend Bush never happened. And then Trump came along and he's twice as bad as Bush. But let's be clear, too. Let's be clear that the reason Trump appealed to the Republican base is he was not willing to deny that Trump, that Bush was a problem. Right. right. He ran against Bush. He ran against being a loser, which was what Bush was in 2008. Right. Right. We're going to do a news roundup. Parlor has a porn problem. That Parlor right wing Twitter type website. Uh, who could have predicted that they won't ban me for shit posting racism? Website would have scamming nudie websites swarm in. Yeah. Uh, Rachel Maddow this week reminded Trump's legal team that SCOTUS does not recognize filing by tweets. What? That said, it appears that together the Trump campaign, the RNC, their joint fundraising committee, and the president's new fundraising arm raised over, wait for it, $207 million in the last month. This is per CNN. And they have not filed anything with SCOTUS as no. of Monday no. of this week. No, no law filings at all with the Supreme Court. Barack Obama admitted to Stephen Colbert that he has not scheduled a post-presidency golf game with Donald Trump. I understand he's a good golfer, but shockingly enough, there are sometimes problems with the scoring. That Barack Obama always trashing the norms of our of our great (laughs) democracy. You remember when uh, when Eisenhower and uh, and uh, Truman had their their golf game? Everyone remembers that, right? That it's it's just tradition for all presidents to golf with each other after their you know, knocked off. Um, In COVID news, which is a separate category now, the U.S. recorded over 3,100 COVID-19 deaths in a single day this week, marking the single worst day death toll since the pandemic began and surpassing the April 15th high 
of 2,752 deaths. And I'm going to skip the rest of the COVID news because if you don't know it, if you know it, you know it. And if you are trying to avoid the news about that, I understand. Yeah. Um, I do want to say just from a behind the scenes look at Crooks and Liars, uh, we're having a challenge being overrun with posts about a COVID denier has de- has died of COVID. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, three weeks ago, Mayor so-and-so ran around saying masks are stupid and now he's dead. And two weeks and ago, so, Pastor so-and-so said, yeah, Pastor the so-and-so be said, right. Yeah. And now he's dead. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the schadenfreude is over. Yeah. I don't feel any sense of, aha, we got you now. No. We taught you a lesson. You're dead or your whole family's dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's we're just done sad. with that. It's just sad. And it's just sad. And it's sad that this is a Republican thing. Yep. That this is a party thing. That mm-hmm. when you look at maps and you see that Illinois is doing better than other than other than Michigan, every other state surrounding Illinois is doing worse than Illinois. Mm-hmm. But Michigan and Illinois are doing better at this because they have Democratic governors. Well, and this is, if I could interject, this is not mm-hmm. COVID news. This is um, the idea of being realistic about politics. Mm-hmm. Um, the message of the last election was that Republicans in the House and the Senate and Donald Trump have collectively screwed you up, gone AWOL during a pandemic, and have nearly broken our democracy. And it didn't win. Yeah. Lindsey Graham didn't lose his seat. Susan Collins is still there. Lisa Murkowski is still there. Here in Illinois 13th, our Democratic candidate, who lost her House race by 3,000 votes in 2018, lost it to lost it by 30,000 votes to the same opponent in 2020. Mm-hmm. So it's very mm-hmm. important that we have a practical understanding of what's possible in our politics. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that, you know, Georgia may or may not change anything, but don't bet on it. If, right. if Democrats lose one seat in Georgia, I'm praying that they don't. I'm praying Democrats get both of them. But if Democrats lose one seat in Georgia, Mitch McConnell gets to say, you know what, we're not going to have a we're not going to have a bill. We're going to have whatever I want. Right. And so it's right. really important that we not get too high and mighty about w- what demands we're making. When from a practical point of view, we can get some stuff, but some and it's better to have some stuff and save people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And eat and eat some of our principles and say, you know what, we're just screwed. We have no leverage than it is to sort of fold our arms and say, nope, you know, it's our way. Because we've already negotiated. We've already lowered our demands by 50 percent. And Mr. Powell right. hasn't budged a goddamn inch. Right. So if that means I have to, you know, go arm the, in arm. The House with, moved to adjourn yesterday. The Republicans in the House moved to adjourn. Yeah. So if I have to, you know, go now, they arm don't have arm, the votes to do that in the House, but they moved to adjourn. They, they tried to. Yeah. And so if I have to pa- buddy up with for one vote with Susan Collins <laughs> and Lisa Murkowski. To get $300 to unemployed people who are going to lose I'll their apartment. I'll do yeah. it. I'm not I'm not a purity asshole. Not proud. No. Not proud. Anyway, um, in stupid coup news, um, one week after Donald Trump pardoned Michael Flynn, you know, his first national security advisor, who pleaded guilty twice to lying to the FBI, uh, Michael Flynn could be found this week openly advocating a military coup against the United States government in order to keep Donald Trump in power. He was accompanied by Scott O'Grady, who is Donald Trump's nominee for Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. Instead of a press conference or even a Fox News phone in, this week Trump released an unhinged 46-minute Facebook video rant denouncing the election as rigged while repeating the same lies about voter fraud that he claims was massive and on a scale of never seen before. And he went on and on and on. Uh, He also called his speech, his 46-minute Facebook Live thing, the most important speech I've ever made. Might be. Might be the most important speech. Yeah, well, I'm hoping it's the last one you ever make, but, you know, that's great. Trump and his otherwise loyal goon named uh, Bill Barr, you might have heard of him, had what some people called a contentious meeting at the White House and others called a screaming match after Barr said that he just couldn't find evidence enough to call the last election a widespread fraud against the American people. And that was that. Remember Scott Atlas, the quack radiologist with no experience in immunology that Trump made his coronavirus advisor? who lied constantly about basic public health man- measures, he resigned this week. Oh, no, not Scott Atlas. He looked so good on TV. Um, Heidi Stirrup, who I'd never heard of before this week, uh, but sh- there's a White House liaison to the just- Justice Department, and that's her. 
has been barred from the building after trying to bully staffers into lying about election fraud. Ivanka Trump was deposed as part of a lawsuit from the Washington, D.C. Attorney General over the costs of Trump's 2017 inauguration. Donald Trump discussed whether to grant preemptive pardons to Donald Trump Jr., Eric Trump, Ivanka Trump, and Jared Trump. Yeah. <laughs> Jared Trump Kushner. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Justice Department is investigating a potential bribery for pardon scheme involving a large political contribution in exchange for a presidential pardon by the White House. Oh, Donald Trump. <laughs> I know. I just. Donald I wonder Trump, if that was initiated by Jared. I yeah. would, I'm assuming that it was. Well, yeah. you know, it's. Is there money involved? Because I like money. Yes, I, there is. Jared likes money. He yes. likes money. He really needs money, too. Uh, Donald Trump threatened to veto the annual defense bill authorization for nearly $1 trillion in spending unless Congress repeal the federal law that gives online companies legal protection for the content of their platforms. This is because people called him Diaper Don on Twitter. So whatever you do, don't get on Twitter and go hashtag Diaper Don over and over and over again. Because As if Mitch McConnell, who's trying to protect every corporation in America from liability over COVID. Yeah is going to repeal a federal law that prevents, you know, Twitter and Google from having liability over what random people post on their websites. Mm -hmm. And this last one is yours, Joe DeGeneva. Oh, uh, Joe DeGeneva, one of the hopefully soon to be disbarred lawyers for the Trump campaign, called for the former head of the U.S. cybersecurity to be executed for saying that the election was the most secure in United States history. Mm -hmm. After he was called on that uh, and told that he was likely to be disbarred for that, he said, oh, I was just a joke. I was just joking. You know, I, you know, I got a lot of jokes like that, and mostly they land me in Twitter jail. So mm -hmm. um, I wanted to call out the best tweets of the week came from Leslie Jones. Yeah. Uh, her rant on Mitch McConnell, mofo Rich <laughs> McConnell, is I want, I want a little... I said on Twitter, I want a little speaker on my desk that just plays that all day long. Can I have that as my um, ringtone? That'd be great. That'd be just great. <laughs> and uh, Sugary71 said, uh, and, and this was great, if crowd size ac accurately reflected voter sentiment, Jerry Garcia would have become president a long time ago. Yes, he would have. <laughs> We also want to wish everyone a happy Zappadan. Yes, Zappadan ha starts today. Happy Zappadan. Yeah, and uh, I did a little Photoshop for Zappadan uh, that will be up at my blog. If you Google Blue Gal, you can go take a look at it. Or I also posted it on the Twitter machine. And Zappadan is that brief period uh, during the year between Zappa's death and birth when he was not on, on Earth. He was not on Earth. Mm -hmm. From December 4th to December 21st is Zappadan. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I have a little write-up that I put at my uh, blog years ago. And it, it's very brief. Uh, too many years ago to count accurately, the blog known as the Aristocrats, which is no longer in existence, mm -hmm. uh, declared that December 4th through 21st should henceforth be known as Zappadan, the days of the year between death and birth, that ethereal time when there was no Frank. Yes. So we must celebrate him to keep his spirit safe until his birthday again. Mm-hmm. Or it's just a great excuse for a party that has nothing to do with the greed and debt festival known as Christmas in America. Yeah. In any event, it's a labor of love with the hope that Frank Zappa would be proud. Uh, mm -hmm. And some people say, and we love to say some people say. We do. That the miracles of Zappadan is a bunch of hooey, but I disagree. No. During the first Zappadan in 2006, John Bolton resigned. From the Bush White House. It's a miracle. It's a Zappadan miracle. It's a miracle. miracle. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then the next year, uh, the one of the aristocrats bloggers, Sandy Underpants, went to the registry of motor vehicles during Zappadan and got a new license plate with no lines, no waiting, and free donuts. It's a miracle of Zappadan. Another Zappadan miracle. These are all <laughs> authorized, another... certified miracles. Zappadan miracle. So when, if something wonderful happens... Before December 21st, you need to recognize that's a Zappadan miracle. You flag it. You send it to us. You we might it. announce it. We might announce it on the show. Mm -hmm. And we'd love to hear from you what your Zappadan miracles are. Please send them to us. And uh, put in the uh, subject line of your email, Zappadan miracle. Okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.
And lest you think that all the crazy news is is uh, national, contained with a national <laughs> level. Oh no, no, we live in Trump country. Let's remind mm-hmm. people we live in Trump country. Uh, and one of our local aldermen, Chuck Redpath, who is a, a tireless advocate for bars and restaurants, but not actual people, uh, used a city council meeting to openly question whether the county officials were counting COVID cases correctly, suggesting that maybe the numbers around here only seemed high because they were including non-county residents. And then if they only seemed high, well, maybe we could open the restaurants and the bars and then his, his <laughs> People would be Maybe happy. someone might be in Sangamon County who doesn't actually live here and yeah. they might have COVID and we shouldn't count them. Shouldn't count them. And then we should a... open the restaurants even though they're in Sangamon County. Yeah. Our, our yeah. conflict diverse mayor promptly ducked the question. Who knows? Of I'm course. not sure. I don't know what to do. Uh, <laughs> while the actual public health official basically took Red Path to school on yeah. how shit gets done with, you know, health and arithmetic. Which mm-hmm. made him and show viruses. Up. Yeah. 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 No, we have a very um, Republican city council and we have a very, very, as I said, conflict diverse mayor who doesn't like people yelling at him. So he, he just likes to talk about city of Springfield, you oh, know, and, and how much we love the tourists coming down for the, the Route 66, you know. He's, and his dad was mayor. So, you know, his there's dad that. was mayor and uh-huh. he's there to uh, praise the police and fire and all the city officials who do their job, job so well every he's day. He's got one yes. speech. It's on a post-it note. and he It's on a post-it it note. No, <laughs> just at the drop of a hat, he'll break it out. And, you know. <laughs> it, it is hilarious. And I, I don't hate the mayor. No. I really don't. No. Uh, but he he is a uh, functionary, right? He, he just he, d- he does his job. And if it is if there's a controversy, he's sure to walk away. Oh, <laughs> if you've ever seen the Andy Griffith show, he's the mayor of Mayberry. Um, yeah. Just old. Yeah. Okay? And it's just very like, I don't want anyone to hate me. <laughs> he's <laughs> he's good at cutting ribbons. Yeah, he's excellent at that. <laughs> yeah. He's got that down pat. Um, but he's not right. the world shaker, uh, you know, leader in civic um, advancement that this city, frankly, really needs. Or or. Nor is he a um, expert in public health. No. 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 <laughs> Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is Pierrot. Pierrot is named after the clown dressed in white and black from the Comedie dell'Arte. He has only been living in his forever home for a very short time. And he is a pandemic comfort kitty, oh, which is wonderful. It's a great job. Uh, but, you know... When when you're a pandemic comfort kitty, uh, you you have to take over pretty quickly because you know things are out of control. A lot of area, so, a lot of territory. A lot of area, and so he has taken over both the sofa and the chair in the living room. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I he, pronounce you know, this couch clean. Yes, this couch and this chair and all the furniture is mine. Mm-hmm. And uh, Piro uh, each freshly poured cat food, of course, our fake sponsor, and. Uh, he does not sleep on the carpet. <laughs> he is always above as as our own Bosco. Uh, Pierrot is black and white like Bosco is. And you, yeah. they like to be up high, those they black do. and white kitties. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store direct, your pet will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured. Freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Pierrot at our Facebook page or website. And you can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write to us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go, Postal Unions. Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Hashtag save the post office. And that's another really good reason to push hard for uh, the Georgia Senate races. Yes. Uh, President Biden will have to replace uh, three people on the Postal Service Board in order to replace Louis DeJoy. Mm -hmm. And he can't do that with Mitch McConnell in charge of the Senate. Nope. Nope. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job, and it's a labor of love. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Both our PayPal and postal address information is there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you for doing that. Hey, Driftglass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? 
Well, Blue Gal, the internet cases are deadlocked over whether Timothy Dalton was better as James Bond in The Living Daylights and License to Kill or Prince Baron in Flash Gordon. But they're not deadlocked over whether if there was a man by the pretenders and Gladys Knight singing License to Kill was better than Queen performing Flash, oh, savior of the universe on Flash Gordon. Flash, oh, he's savior of the universe. What's that I hear? Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, lovey dovey. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2019-2020. DGBG Productions.